know that heartburn has nothing to do with your heart? It's actually a pain in the esophagus, the tube that connects your mouth to your stomach. Hi, I'm Dr. Griffin Rogers, bringing you healthy moments from the NIH. I'm the director of the National Institute of Diabetes, Digestive, and Kidney Diseases. If you feel a burning type pain in your chest once a week or less, try avoiding foods and drinks that may trigger it, such as caffeinated coffee, alcohol, or tomatoes. And over-the-counter medications such as antacids may be helpful. If you feel heartburn twice a week or more, or have been using antacids for more than two weeks, see a doctor. She may prescribe medications or recommend lifestyle changes, like quitting smoking or eating smaller meals. Don't ignore the pain of frequent heartburn, because it can damage the lining of your esophagus. For more information, follow us on Twitter at NIDDKGov. This is Dr. Griffin Rogers with the NIH. Welcome to Beyond the Data. I'm Dr. Phoebe Thorpe, and here with me today is Dr. Alicia Fry, Branch Chief of the Influenza Epidemiology and Prevention of the Influenza Division here at CDC. Thank you so much for joining us, Alicia. Thank you. Today's session was about severe seasonal influenza. Um, what should you do if you, know, if you suspect you have the flu? Well, that's a great question. Now, if it's very early and you're just starting to have symptoms, it's probably worth calling your doctor. This is especially important if you're an older adult, 65 or older, or if you're a parent with a very young child, or if you have any underlying medical conditions such as diabetes or heart problems or lung problems. You, if you get, get to your doctor early and get antivirals early, these drugs can help you. They can reduce the severity of your illness and they can make you feel better quicker. And we learned today, too, that they can also reduce the length of hospitalizations? That's right. There are studies that suggest that in hospitalized patients, they can, uh, antivirals can reduce uh, the length of your hospitalization. And really, if you have just regular old flu that doesn't require hospitalization, these drugs can reduce your illness by at least about one day. So tell me, what can you do? to prevent yourself from getting the flu? Well, the best way to prevent yourself from getting the flu is to get the flu vaccine. Now, right now, we recommend that the flu vaccine is given to everybody six months and older every year. And even, we like people to get vaccinated before the flu season, but even if the flu season is already ongoing, it's not too late to get vaccinated. So if you haven't been vaccinated, go ahead and get vaccinated. Also in the session today, we heard about the complexity of matching the vaccine to the strains that are coming every year, because every year there's a new strain. Tell me a little bit about that. Well, you know, influenza viruses are constantly changing. And there are several different types of viruses that are circulating. So right now, there's an H3N2 virus circulating and some B, virus, B viruses. And in other years, we have H1N1 viruses. And actually, each vaccine has four different viruses in it. And all of these viruses are changing. And so the vaccine has to be updated very frequently so that it matches the strains that are circulating. And that's really one of the main reasons why you need to get vaccinated every year. Okay, so everybody needs to be vaccinated every year, but some people don't. What are some of the common barriers that causes people not to get vaccines? Well, I think some people think it's hard to find the vaccine, but you know, more than 150 million doses of vaccine were produced this year. So there is plenty of vaccine out there and still out there. The other thing is, you can get vaccinated now at your doctor's office and at many large retail pharmacies, even grocery stores. So there are a lot of places to get vaccinated. And really, the supply of vaccine shouldn't be a limit at all. And you had mentioned there are some really important uh, individuals that should be vaccinated because if they get flu, they have a chance of getting even more sick. 
than people who are relatively healthy. Can you remind me which groups those are? That's right. There are some people who are at higher risk of having severe complications from flu. Those are the very young, so children under the eight, two and under, mm -hmm. the very old, so adults 65 and older, pregnant women, um, people who have immunosuppression, and people who have certain underlying medical conditions like heart disease or lung disease or diabetes. Those are all reasons to get the vaccine. Those are all special, special reasons, reasons to get, get the vaccine, vaccine. that's yes. right. And what about healthcare providers? What can healthcare providers do? Well, you know, healthcare providers are very important because we know that if a healthcare provider suggests to a patient that they get vaccinated, that that patient is much more likely to get vaccinated. So it's very important for clinicians to urge their patients to get vaccinated. vaccinated. And every year. That's right, every yeah. year. Yeah. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. And thank you for joining us. See you next time on Beyond the Data. You take care of yourself, but sometimes you need to find a doctor. That's why Physician Compare is here for you. Welcome to Physician Compare, a website created by the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, or CMS. All physicians and other clinicians listed on Physician Compare take part in Medicare. And there are three different ways to find the information you need. Let's take a look at how Linda, Mary, and Don use the Physician Compare website to select their doctors. Linda is a Medicare patient looking for a new primary care physician in her area. She lives in Crest Hill, Illinois. The location box automatically recognized the location of her computer, and Crest Hill, Illinois is filled in for her. Linda enters Primary Care Physician into the main search bar. The drop-down box gives a few options for what she may be searching for. She makes a choice from the drop-down box based on her needs. Here is the results page of physicians who practice internal medicine in Linda's area. Physicians are listed on the left of the page in order of distance from Linda's location. She can pick from either a group or an individual clinician. The map on the right has pins to show practice locations. Linda's current location is shown with a blue pin. Linda can use the filters across the top of the screen to refine this list of physicians based on distance, Medicare approved payment amount, gender, and more. She can use the Add to Compare button on a listing to compare as many as three different physicians or three different groups. These two icons indicate that this physician accepts the Medicare approved payment amount and has performance information available to view. Performance information shows whether the doctor provided patients the recommended care. Now let's see how Mary uses Physician Compare. Mary's current neurologist wants her to get a second opinion for her constant migraines. Mary and her caregiver, Nancy, visit the Physician Compare website and begin their search for a clinician. They find the Search by Body Part button. Mary clicks on the diagram of a woman's body. They can pick the area of the body they're concerned about. Mary chooses head from the list of available body parts on the right and then selects the next button. She then selects headache slash migraine from the list of health topics. She selects neurology from the list of specialties. Mary is redirected to the results page. She and Nancy select a group from the list. Nancy has a friend who told her she got great care there. They read about Medicare approved payment amounts, affiliated clinicians, and performance information and decide this group would be a good fit for her. Finally, let's see how Don uses Physician Compare. Don's primary care physician wants him to see a cardiologist for some chest pain he's been having recently. He's having difficulty spelling cardiologist, 
but then he sees the Browse by Specialty button. Don selects the letter C at the top of the page and it automatically takes him to all specialties beginning with the letter C. As he goes to pick cardiology, he sees that when he hovers over each term, a definition appears to explain what the specialty is. Don selects cardiology and is redirected to the results page where he sees a list of available cardiologists in his area. He chooses a group. He notices that this group accepts Medicare-approved payment amounts and has performance information available. Don also sees that this group has patient survey scores. He chooses the tab. These scores are based on information patients reported about their experiences getting care from the group. Based on the feedback, Don decides this would be a good group for him to visit. He's glad this website was able to provide him with vital information so he could make an informed decision to improve his health. Quality health care is important for everyone. The Physician Compare website is one of many ways CMS is working to help you make informed decisions about your health care. Explore the resources available to you on Physician Compare today. The U.S. Cancer Statistics, USCS, brings together cancer data from CDC's National Program of Cancer Registries and the National Cancer Institute's Surveillance, Epidemiology, and End Results Program. It covers all 50 states, Washington, D.C., and Puerto Rico. USCS can be used to look at cancer trends over time, discover what groups are affected most by cancer, and find out if and when cancer screening and prevention are working. You can access this information through the Data Visualizations tool, explore state and county level cancer data over time, create full color charts, maps, and graphs, learn how to use the data, and much more. The Public Use Database, which includes over 24 million cancer cases, lets researchers analyze anonymous information about tumors and cancer patients. You can find it all at cdc.gov cancer. U.S. Cancer Statistics, the official federal cancer statistics. Kicking a soccer ball, jumping rope, and shooting baskets. What do these activities have in common? Hi, I'm Dr. Griffin Rogers, Director of the National Institute of Diabetes, Digestive, and Kidney Diseases at NIH. All of these activities are fun ways for children to get physically fit and to improve their health. Our kids don't need to run marathons or take expensive classes, but they do need to be more active. Try these tips. Limit their TV and video game time. Encourage them to get moving with fun activities. And lead by example. If your kids see you being physically active and having fun, they're more likely to join in and stick with it. Being active is a big deal. It can help your children avoid future health problems like diabetes and high blood pressure. To learn more tips to help your children stay active, follow us on Twitter at NIDDKGov. This is Dr. Griffin Rogers with the NIH. Have you ever had difficulty getting your medical records in an emergency? Or arrive to an appointment with a doctor to find out that they can't access your recent test results? As we try to get and stay healthy, we often face the frustration that comes with trying to access, organize, and share our healthcare records and data. This status quo is no longer acceptable. That's what My Healthy Data is all about. An initiative from the White House Office of American Innovation, the goal of My Health eData is to support the seamless flow of health data from provider to patient. This will begin to break down the barriers that contribute to preventing patients from being able to access their medical records and share them with the providers they choose. With cross-government coordination from places like the Department of Health and Human Services and the Department of Veterans Affairs, my Healthy Data will put your data at your fingertips and help you work with your doctors and other providers to make informed decisions about your care. 
My Healthy Data builds on progress made over the past decade in spreading the use of health information technology. Back in 2008, only 17% of doctors and 9% of hospitals use this type of technology. Today, that number has jumped to 78% of doctors and 96% of hospitals. Despite the significant progress, in many ways, we've traded paper silos for electronic silos. Our healthcare information is often still trapped within a given healthcare provider's IT system. This makes it hard to get your records and transfer them to other providers. And it's even harder to get those records in a form that can be used by healthcare innovators and researchers. With My Healthy Data, we're focusing on three outcomes. Empowering patients by putting your data in your hands. Increasing competition. Making data portable and shareable among all providers will reduce costs. And encouraging innovation by cooperating to find new ways to realize the true potential of health information technology. Many of the tools we need to make this data sharing a reality already exist. Now's the time to make sure you can access and share your healthcare data securely wherever and whenever you need it most. Hi, and welcome to Beyond the Data. I'm Dr. Phoebe Thorpe, and here with me today is Rear Admiral Wanda Barfield, the Director of the Division of Reproductive Health here at CDC. Wanda, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Phoebe. Your session that from two years ago about neonatal abstinence, we we're rerunning. Part of the reason we're rerunning it is because the opioid epidemic continues to worsen in the United States. Um, what is neonatal abstinence? So um, it, it's great that we're doing uh, another opportunity to talk about beyond the data here. Neonatal abstinence syndrome is something that I know very personally. In addition to directing the Division of Reproductive Health, I'm also a neonatologist, which is a specialist in pediatrics that focuses on the care of critically ill newborns. Neonatal abstinence syndrome is a withdrawal syndrome that occurs for babies who've been exposed to opioids during pregnancy. Now, this may occur under a variety of circumstances, but the challenge here has been more recently, we've seen it as a result of the opioid crisis. So neonatal abstinence syndrome can occur when there's withdrawal that a pregnant woman has after her baby is born and that baby has been exposed to either prescription substances that include substances like Vicodin, Oxycontin, or it can be illicit substances that can also include heroin or it can be exposure to um, medication-assisted treatment, such as buprenorphine or methadone. And these infants have symptoms that occur about 48 to 72 hours after birth. And these symptoms are fairly distressing. They include things like excessive crying, inconsolability, they may have difficulty feeding, they may have watery stools or diarrhea, they may also um, have seizures. And so these particular symptoms and signs need to be treated and they need to be treated in a gradual method. So when these newborns have the neonatal abstinence syndrome and are going through with all, what, what needs to be done to treat them? So the treatment can be somewhat complicated and protracted. So these infants need time in terms of a gentle weaning from these medications. And so as a result, they're given medications so that they can reduce these symptoms that we're seeing when they're initially having withdrawal symptoms. Most infants may show signs of withdrawal anywhere between 48 to 72 hours after birth. Because it takes time for these infants to recover, it means that they need close and careful monitoring in either a newborn intensive care unit or they may need very close monitoring in a special care nursery. And so as a result, that means they've got 
prolonged hospitalization, and as you know, that can be expensive. They also need to be closely monitored for these signs and symptoms that could potentially get them into a lot of trouble. We know that in the United States, in fact, that the cost of neonatal abstinence syndrome is about $2.5 billion, with the major burden being borne by Medicaid at about $2 billion. Each year? Each year. Wow. What, what are we doing? So it, I would imagine that if you, um, the increased use of, of opioids, well, use and abuse of opioids in women who are pregnant is part of the reason that the neonatal abstinence syndrome is going up. What are some of the important things to help the moms, uh, with the women who are pregnant, to prevent neonatal abstinence syndrome? Yes, Phoebe, you bring up an important point. It's, you know, it's important to note that we, we coined the issue of neonatal abstinence syndrome as really the tip of the iceberg. This is really sort of the final result of a much more complicated issue. And for every baby that we see with neonatal abstinence syndrome, there's a mom who's in great need of support. Mm -hmm. But it goes beyond that. This is really a life course issue. And we really need to think not only of the care and concern of the baby, but the care and concern for mothers and even for women prior to pregnancy. You know, many women may not even know that they're pregnant during the time that they may be using a prescription drug. And as a result, they then may find themselves pregnant and treatment during that time may be more challenging. However, there is an opportunity for us to better monitor pregnancies and help women with medication-assisted therapy. Yeah, you bring up a point the, that was uh, one of the things that I was going to ask about, and it came out in the session about medication, medicated, medication-assisted therapy. What, what is that, and how, what, what is being done to, to help women during their pregnancy? So medication-assisted therapy is an opportunity to treat women during pregnancy, but so that they can also be monitored in terms of the use of these substances that include either methadone or buprenorphine. And it also allows an opportunity to not only monitor that woman during her pregnancy, but to help to identify an infant who may potentially have neonatal abstinence syndrome. However, it may be a much more controlled um, path rather than sort of a quick withdrawal. Yeah, it's, so it's very important to, to try to get the women the, the treatment they need while they're pregnant. Yes, and I've had opportunities to, you know, talk with women and talk with families who may be on medication assisted therapy and what they might anticipate in terms of the days of, you know, during delivery and those subsequent days following delivery. And I think that's a really helpful approach. What else needs to be done to reduce or prevent neonatal abstinence syndrome in the United States? So when we, we're thinking about prevention, again, you know, that's an important role that CDC plays in terms of prevention. More broadly, we're really looking at how we can collectively, as an agency, address the opioid crisis, and that's really through um, our combined efforts. So just thinking about what we can do at CDC here, we're really focusing on work collectively. As you know, CDC has produced a lot of information about appropriate prescribing. Mm -hmm. And so CDC has guidelines on appropriate prescribing guidelines for physicians. And that's a very important component that we need to disseminate and help educate providers. You know, the other component is surveillance. It's so important not only that we have good and accurate surveillance, but that it's as rapid as possible. And CDC is really working toward making the data available much more rapidly, whether that's, you know, and this is more broadly, I'm not just talking about neonatal abstinence syndrome, but, you know, what can we do in terms of addiction, emergency room um, mm -hmm. related issues, um, 
the unfortunate event of overdose. So how can we get that information out more quickly so that people can respond? Mm -hmm. For states, there's a lot of exciting work that's going on in the area of what's called perinatal quality collaboratives. And these are teams of healthcare providers as well as public health providers that are working together to think about evidence-based interventions to really improve the care of infants with neonatal abstinence syndrome, as well as improving the care for mothers. So specifically, for example, the challenge that we have now is that our treatment protocols are still somewhat subjective when we're trying to treat infants with NAS, but in the context of a quality improvement framework, mm -hmm. we might be able to do a more standardized, regimented, uh, process of identifying infants at risk, appropriately treating them, and then perhaps reducing those hospital lengths of stay for those newborns. There's also um, better techniques, for example, promoting um, maternal infant bonding and promoting breastfeeding is also a good way to help reduce the length of stay for newborns with regard to neonatal abstinence syndrome. So what I hear is surveillance so they can help figure out where the problem is yes. and then also quality improvement so that they, the solutions that we offer are better too and combining those to make it yes. better, yes. better prevention. Um, if other people are interested in knowing more about clinicians or others about um, uh, the opioid use, misuse, or NAS, where can they find that? Well, there are several resources. So first for providers, there, there's great opportunity through the CDC um, guidelines um, in terms of prescribing practices, but there's also um, clinical groups that are very helpful. For example, the American Academy of Pediatrics has guidance on the care of infants with neonatal abstinence syndrome, as well as the American Association of Obstetricians and Gynecologists, or the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists, and they have guidances for uh, the treatment of women during pregnancy. Thank you so much for joining us. This is such an important topic, and it's, uh, like you said, it's the tip of the iceberg, and so it isn't always seen well. I really appreciate your efforts to make it better known and to help these children and well, their moms. Thank you too, Phoebe, for raising this important issue. And thank you for joining us for Beyond the Data. We'll see you next time. Hi, I'm Angela at the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. I'd like to let you know about how Medicare's mental health benefits might be able to help you live your happiest and healthiest life. Here in the United States, mental illnesses are common. One in five American adults experience mental illness in a given year. In fact, mental health conditions like depression or anxiety can happen to anyone at any time. This is a good time to learn about Medicare's mental health benefits in case you ever need them. These benefits cover services and programs to help diagnose and treat mental health conditions. Outpatient and inpatient mental health care, like psychiatrist visits, an annual depression screening, and family counseling are some of the services that Medicare helps cover. Plus, if you meet certain income and resource limits, you may even qualify for extra help from Medicare to help with prescription drug coverage. If you have problems that affect your mental health, like thoughts about ending your life, trouble concentrating, or lack of energy, talk to a doctor or another health care provider. And if you'd like someone to talk with right away, you can call a crisis counselor at the free and confidential National Suicide Prevention Lifeline at 1-800-273-TALK. That's 1-800-273-TALK. Learn more about mental health and Medicare benefits by visiting Medicare.gov. Mm -hmm.